All right, here we are. Welcome guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those of you who are new to our masterclass, um, we, my name is Chloe Drey Fogel and I am the video editor here at Jazz at Lincoln Center. Um, uh, in just a minute, we're gonna join Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra member, saxophonist, multi-instrumentalist and composer Ted Nash for a masterclass on his approach to composition his tips on how you can find inspiration in your life and work to compose music. Um, after the lesson, Ted will answer some questions from all of you guys. At that point, I'll jump back in and explain how to ask him a question. For now, we hope you enjoy this JLCO Masterclass with Mr. Ted Nash. And I'll turn it over to Ted, who I'm trying to unmute. There you are. I just did, I saw your little, I saw your little thing there. But uh, thank you, Chloe. Always good yeah. to see you on these. Yeah, you um, too. Yeah, and it's always good to have help uh, technologically. <laughs> um, hey, everybody, this is great. So this will be informal. We're gonna have a good time, and I, I totally want to um, get with questions and, and make it a back and forth as much as we can. But I'm gonna start just by talking a little bit about the about the process of composing, and it's not so much about the technical thing. I mean, we can talk about that, but it's, it's more about inspiration. It's about how do we, like, for example, um, for example, here, well, you all see that, right? Yep. It's a blank page. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've sat down to write music and that's what's in front of you. You know, it's like, all right, now what? <laughs> and I feel like that's a bit daunting. I mean, it's great because it's like anything goes, it's, anything can happen now. And at this point, you have, to, you have to sort of get some ideas about what you want to accomplish. What are your goals? What, what are your objectives? Um, the, uh, one of the greatest things, and I've mentioned this before in times that I've, and I've done workshops and things. So if you've heard this before, I'm sorry, but I worked with the great actress Glenn Close in a couple of different situations. We're working on a project right now. And I, I was, we were, we were getting together and working through this material. And I asked her about her process. And she, um, like, the, are you a method actor? Are you, uh, what's your technique? Do you do this, Stanislavski, blah, blah. And she's like, you know, I don't really, I don't really use any kind of particular approach. It, it's just my imagination. I use my imagination. I was like, okay, cool. Imagination, yeah. But the more and more I thought about that, I'm more I, I understood that the imagination is everything. So, you know, how, how can we bring our imaginations? I, I, I'm staying in a house with, with a couple of kids right now while I'm kind of in semi-lockdown here in Atlanta. And they're four and six. And my God, they will go all day long. Hey, this is happening here. We're building this wall and this is the police. And then the, the, the dinosaurs on the moon. And then and I'm like, my God, none of this is possible, right? But it is to them because they're four and they're six. And so their imaginations are ripe and, and expressive and it's very inspiring. And I think about Picasso, or I think about artists, musicians who find the childlike quality in their art. And I find that to be very, very inspiring. When my kids were, um, were very young, they would draw and I saved all of their drawings. I've got boxes of, their, of all of their paintings and drawings. And I look at them and I'm like, there's no way I could do that now. There's no way I could sit there and paint that. I don't have that kind of imagination that they had. And, um, and but, but we can work to really inspire our own imaginations. And I think composing music is such an, a great opportunity for us to, to examine our own imaginations and share that with other people. And um, like, for example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk just a couple about a couple of different projects that I that I that I worked with. Um, one is uh, is with this artist, and I'll share I'll share this. Um, this is um, Mark Chagall, one of the greatest painters. And if you talk about imagination, I was ten or eleven. I was at the at the Guggenheim Museum and. It wasn't this painting, it was one like it. And here's a, here's a guy who's on top of the roofs. He's got, pe people are floating in the air. There's often animals floating in the air and he's playing the violin and it's and he's green. It's like all the kind of things that, that children 
um, you know, deal with. And um, I'm going to see if I can play just a little bit of, of this Chagall piece. Um, tell me, maybe you could you could tell me, uh, Chloe, if this is if this is working. Yeah. You all still see the painting, right? Yeah. Okay. We hear you. Okay, good. I'm gonna advance a little bit to here. Okay. So this painting, to me, it, it reminded I had three people on him. It reminded me of growing up in the ghetto and there's animals everywhere. And every Sunday, all the musicians get together, get out their violins and their accordions, and they play. So I tried to imagine what that would be like. Violin and violin together. It's feeling almost absurd. I just uh, kind of allowed myself to come up with, and here's the animal sounds. Chicken, cows. It's just way up the very end of the feed. idea so i had to play the clarinet on that it was quite difficult hey but, ted yeah just so you're aware when you, you talk over the music we we pick up like every four or five words okay good so we, we didn't hear everything you said <laughs> that's fine <laughs> that's that's fine it's better to hear the music than me talking um but basically i was just saying that uh the, the this sort of i was 10 years old when i first saw his painting at the at the guggenheim and i just i, I was sat there and, it, and it, i still think about that that feeling and that reaction that I had, which was the imagination, an animal, a cow flying over the you know moon and the and all this stuff. So these are the kind of things that I put into the music. And I would not have thought of any of that had I not been thinking about this painter or this painting or his history or all these images and all this childlike imagination. And um, another example of that is um, is a Jackson Pollock, who. Um, whose art, I mean, we all know that he, how he worked, we've seen enough about him, right? Do y'all see that? He splattered, he splattered stuff onto the, like this, he would just drip it and throw it and toss it. And um, I kept thinking of like, how, how can I make, how can I represent that musically? Um, and he and he wasn't even necessarily my favorite my favorite artist, um, but his paintings really gave me a lot of texture and a lot of action and a lot of feeling about the process that he went through. And so um, so I went to the piano, and I just thought, I right, what is if I if I if I do what he's doing at the piano, it's kind of like, it's sort of like that. I'm just tossing, tossing the paint on the piano. And I, just, I don't know if it, it, maybe it doesn't seem quite like music, but I thought, well, that's something to go, that's something for me to, to work with. This idea of like phrases that are like splatters of paint. And um, um, I'll play a little bit of this. This is, uh, so, so I end up with all these fragments, strung them together, gave them to the rhythm section, and then uh, we made a whole complete kind of piece out of it. I'll just play the melody part of it, but anyway, you can check this out. You can hear that, right?
I'm going to cut off the great Sherman Irby there. Um, Ed, do you mind p putting the names of the pieces, uh, either saying them out loud or putting them maybe in the chat? We have some folks asking. Sure. Um, so um, the very first piece that was based on Chagall is, uh, I think I just called it uh, Chagall. And um, let's see, do I hit return? iPhone 9 is not in this meeting. Oh, 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 I see. I have it. I have it. I have the chat um, private for okay. now. It's fine. It's so, just Chagall. Chagall. And that's from Portrait in Seven Shades. And uh, the next piece was just called Pollock. So they were all named after the artists. And uh, yeah, Chagall, Portrait in Seven Shades, Pollock from uh, Portrait in Sh Seven Shades as well. Um, and uh, again, I came up with um, feelings that uh, one of the pieces was uh, for Monet. So I thought about uh, Impressionism and Impressionistic music, and I listened a lot to Debussy and Ravel, but I always have, but I paid particular attention to the types of chords that they used. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of majors. <laughs> A lot of majors with sharp 11s. There's a lot of double diminished, diminished. And that kind of sound, very impressionistic type, types of harmony. So when I did um, the piece for Monet, I explored a lot of this kind of harmony that for me felt like impressionist music. Uh, and then there's, there were seven artists total. And each one was a completely different journey for me. One was Matisse, Picasso. And Picasso, I dealt with... Uh, not only his background coming from Spain and some of the influences of Spanish music and flamenco uh, in the part, early part of the piece, but later I dealt with cubism and I, I worked with uh, basically the square, the side of a cube, and everything that I wrote was in fourths. So the, the harmony was in fourths. The, there were, I mean, there were four different chords. There were four different, you know, harmonic centers. The trombones were stacking fourths. The melody was based on fourths. So everything I was exploring different ways. I was stacking stuff fourths apart and creating all sorts of uh, mirror images and stuff and putting it on top. So it was sort of like I used the computer to do a lot of the work. And for me, that was, that was pushing myself because I hadn't done that before. And I think about Picasso as being really an innovator and I was trying to push myself into my own innovations. So any way that we can find inspiration to be creative, whether it's our own complete imagination, like little kids who just imagine things are happening and anything can happen and you can't tell them and you can't, because I heard that an argument yesterday about how uh, this four-year-old said, no, this is what's happening. And someone said, that's impossible. And he got so mad because he said, of course it's possible, because I can imagine it. And, um, and that's inspiring to see that again. And uh, a lot of my process is, uh, involves just shutting my eyes and laying down and just kind of listening to where I am in the, in the piece of music and sort of like it's almost there already and I just have to discover it. And I love that part of the process for myself. Um, in a more recent uh, piece of music, I, I, again, I was kind of confronted with that blank piece of, of manuscript paper and I had this project. It was Jazz Lincoln Center had commissioned me to write a, a, a whole set, an hours long, a long set. Um, of music on whatever theme I wanted it to be. So uh, when you're given that kind of blank manuscript, you have to start somewhere. So I started thinking about uh, this, this, uh, this man, he's in the business. He said, we were talking about music, we're talking about career, uh, access to your own creativity, all this kind of stuff. And he says, you know, you've got to really embrace your mythology. You've got to I was like, your mythology? And he was talking about, you know, who you are, where you're from, the era that you grew up in, of the, uh, your parents, what they did, uh, everything from, you know, your background, race, uh, gender, all these things are who you are and cr create your mythology. And he said the more that you can tap into that, the more your art can be honest because it's coming from a place that's true and honest inside of you. Um, and you don't have to do that to be creative. I mean, a lot of people don't, but the idea that maybe 
exploring your background and bringing that to your creativity, to your art, could help make it be more either accessible or moving or, or possibly people could believe it more in, a, in some way because it comes from you. And uh, I went back to sort of my childhood and my, my parents who were civil rights activists and uh, I've been thinking a lot about them, especially my mother who passed 10 years ago because uh, she was very active in the 60s and early 70s. And just if she'd see what's happening now, I don't, you know, it'd be interesting to have the conversation with her. But, uh, but growing up with them and being sort of um, exposed to a lot of different people and, th and ways to think about things, and in particular, uh, you know, the demonstrations and things that were going on back then, the idea that they fought so hard for human rights and civil rights, freedom, is something that I hadn't thought about very much, but it is a very strong part of who I am. Um, whether I'm acting on it on a regular basis or not, it's still at the core of who I am. So I decided, okay, I'm going to deal with um, history in this sense. I'm going to I'm going to take speeches, historic speeches, um, by political leaders dealing with um, human rights freedom, civil rights, things like that. So I started to, to listen to different speeches and I was really, um, I started paying more attention, not only to the content of what they were saying, but the flow of what they were saying. Like just now I'm speaking now and I could say, well, well, you know, well, well, I am, you know, talking about something that is, you know, whatever. I could say there's actual tones to what I'm saying and I could identify those tones. Um, everything, every sound that we hear is a pitch. I've been listening to my, uh, mockingbirds. There's a lot of mockingbirds in this area where I'm living, and I love them. First of all, they have a bad reputation as being ripping off other birds. They don't. They make up their own sounds. They will just sing. They get up on a on a, a wire or a high branch. They don't get dressed up. They don't get on a fancy hairstyle. They just sing and sing and sing and sing, and they constantly change their sounds. So it's like. So they're constantly creating, and I think it's extremely inspiring. I'm going to try to do something about that. But getting back to politics, so um, I started to transcribe the speeches, and which was kind of crazy. I started with um, I started with uh, Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, who was. Um, he was, well, I'll show you a picture of him. Y'all, y'all know him. He, uh, I'll share this. This is Nehru. In um, 1947, at, on the eve of India's freedom, he made a speech, it's very famous, called A Tryst with Destiny, or Spoken at Midnight. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful speech because it's when India finally got its freedom from, from you know, being ruled under a, British rule, and uh, he, the speech is recorded. All, all the speeches that I dealt with had to be recorded. So um, I'll, I'll put up this one thing. This is, uh, this is a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this. Oh, that's the wrong one. Um, so, let me, I've got so many windows open, I've got to find my share screen thing here. Here it is. So this is how it started. I, I, his speech was like this, not long ago, we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when his voice was very much in a very shallow area. So I tra you see, so it's starting here like um, Nehru, it says long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when we redeem our pledge, not wholly or, Check out his, his speech, it's, it's interesting, but it's all in a very narrow range, margin of, of, of an interval. So this is, I had uh, literally um, notebook full of pages that looked just like this. And, um, and I had done eight different uh, political leaders. Uh, and this, this piece ended up be call, be, uh, being called a presidential suite. And it's uh, something that we premiered and recorded. But, um, okay, so then I was like, now what do I do with that? But I'm, I'm giving myself ammunition for something. I'm giving myself uh, a bunch of materials to work with. Um, I said, okay, let me take that 
and uh, I will organize the um, the notes into some kind of a, a, a rhythm. You all can see that, right? Good. So it's like, long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. So now I've started to organize it in 4-4, four, four, um, just to give myself a sense of maybe how the thing could flow. And I started to think, well, why am I putting it in four? I mean, that's, it is such a Western uh, time signature. I'm thinking about India and the type of music that they, uh, they create. A lot of it is odd time signature music. So um, I, let's see, I started with this bass line. So let me, let me create little um, tonal centers and try to break the melody down so it'll fit over a bunch of different tonal centers, like little sus chords. So I did that. And um, so, da -da. and I have it over there. So I created this um, sort of ostinato bass line that sounds like it's in 7-8, but I wrote it in 7-4 because it's a little easier to read and feel. And so there I'm starting. Now I've got this little melody fragment. I've got this bass line that's creating different. Um, so it's got different tonal centers that, that, that kind of create a little space for these melodies that I can kind of manipulate now. I don't change the pitches of the melodies, but I fit them into these tonal centers. Um, so now I've, okay, great. I've got some stuff going on here. I'm dealing with the Indian odd time signature thing. Uh, I've got a melody, which I didn't write really. So if you don't like it, I didn't write it. And then, let's see. Okay, good. So then I <laughs> continued to work on, I, I always work with a worksheet. I love working with worksheets because um, I, I put like three staves like that and I have like a piano thing so I can have a couple different things going on. Now I can, now I have got the melody and I start putting in um, uh, some counter line. So I'm starting to develop a melody and a counterline that goes and it supports it, but it's in the same um, same time, and it's over this uh, bass line. But in this worksheet, I wrote it out in four, just because I wanted to, I wanted I wanted the top part to feel in four and the bottom part to feel in seven at the same time. So a little confusing, and I had to decide how to ultimately how to orchestrate that. Um, and then I said, okay, that's not enough. I need to have some other, I need to, I need to sort of create something that's going to make me feel global, like I'm traveling and I'm going to some foreign land. So I created this little, um, another sort of counter line, which is, uh, uh, That kind of thing. So again, it's very ostinato based um, and it's going to support the bass. And now I'm in four, four, four plus two, which is really like a seven plus seven. So I'm experimenting. I'm experimenting with all sorts of different ways to express this thing that I'm trying to deal with in here. And I'm, um, and finally, I chose to be in four plus four plus four plus two. And that was for the ostinato, upper ostinato, and for the melody. And then the bass played over that. So the, um, it ended up looking something like this. Um, you can see the bass line of the bass there. The drums, I have them on a, a, a shakare, a shakare, whatever. And I've given some cues. And now the, the trumpets and the soprano, um, oh, this is later on. This is like a later on part of the piece where, um, uh, where we go to the uh, uh, full ensemble thing. But, so these were like a bunch of different ways that I dealt with, uh, you know, using 
finding inspiration through a political speech, my mythology, experimenting with different ways to express that, trying to figure out context in which to put the melody and all that. It was a lot of work, but I ended up writing something that I would never have, I would never have come up with if I had just sat in front of that blank manuscript paper. And I'll just play a little bit of this. Um, I think you can hear this if I just play it. Anyway, give me a thumbs up. Are you hearing this? And we go into solos, the drums, they open up and it becomes an uh, improvisation over the 7-4, um, basically. Um, but one other funny thing that, that happened as I was working on this, I had the woodwinds and the piano. Uh, at the bass, the bass clarinet was doubling the bass, so he was being used there. Uh, I think Sherman and Vic were, uh, were doubling the piano with this little ostinato thing in the top. I had the two sopranos doubling two trumpets. And, every, and pretty much everybody else, well, the two trumpets were doubling each other. So all four trumpets were involved uh, d uh, doubling. And um, the trombones didn't have anything. And I was like, I don't, I don't really hear much from them. So all I did is I just brought them in on a unison single note that would sort of create a little bit of a rub. I felt like I didn't want them to, to be too perfect in the, the thing. So if it was a sus chord, I put them on the three, uh, just to say, okay, a little rub, you know, just give give some kind of tension where there wasn't any. Um, so it was fun to explore with that. Then after the solos, it just sort of opens up and then everybody plays this full theme again, but completely voiced out um, in a typical kind of big band shout sort of kind of feeling. Um, so I'm just, basically, I'm just sharing with you my process and how I've gone through different different modes of starting from scratch and coming up with how to come up with something using all sorts of outside influences and ideas and, and of course imagination and i'm still trying to find ways to access things that i've never done before and it's exciting um i don't know if uh if there are any questions about any of the material that i've just um played or talked about i'm happy to, to talk about that if you want to raise your hand and i think chloe could probably sure. see that if we wanted to i can i'll open the uh the chat up for now. We had a couple uh, mischievous people at the beginning of the class, which is why I've kept it oh, okay. uh, private. Um, but uh, if, yeah, if, if you guys have anything that comes up as Ted finishes his lesson, um, please, please feel free to use that raise hand function, which is if you click the participants tab um, and you the, then you click the raise hand button, then it'll send your name to the top. I'll unmute you and you can ask your question. If, you, uh, if you'd rather just type your question to me or to everybody, just feel free to use that, uh, that Zoom chat. Um, we do have a question from M. Bell, who I think is Marcy, if I'm not mistaken. It is Marcy. I don't know how it got to be M, but that's what it is. Thank you for explaining this, Ted. It's wonderful. 
Um, I'm curious about the concept of mythology. I think of it in terms of Greek gods and kind of made up stories, but you're using it in a, in a completely different context, more as a biography and history. And so is this something that your friend made up or is this a concept that I'm just not aware of? I think that, because I, I went to the exact same place you did. I thought of Greek mythology. And I thought about stories that, that were not true, but they illustrated something or, um, and, but he talked about your personal mythology and he made a distinction that it was, it was like your personal mythology. So it's, it's the stories and these broader ideas about who you are. And I like that. At first, it was a little confusing to, for me to hear that, just the idea of, of mythology, because we have a certain set, sense of what mythology means. But I think there's a, there are a lot of terms and words like that that we've, we've associated and attached to a specific thing when they are a little more general. Um, regardless, it didn't matter. I understood what he was trying to teach me and tell me was that to embrace my own personal history and background, all the things that have made me who I am. Um, and I think that's what, that's what actors do. I mean, if I go back to thinking about Glenn Close and her imagination, they put themselves in a role and they're like, what, in, what situations that I have dealt with in my life would make me feel a certain way based on what I have to do in this scene, right? Because I, I, when I was in my early 20s, I studied acting. I was curious about it. Um, I studied in New York. And you talk a lot about, the, there's a lot, but basically you do draw on the situations in your life that would be similar enough to the situation that you're dealing with so that you could bring something of reality to it. Um, and I think in, in a in a weird way, that's that happens in the music. Like, don't you think when you hear somebody who, who just is so connected to what they're doing, playing, especially singing, playing, composing, it it's like they're really in touch with themselves. And I find that to be really, really inspiring. I also find um, I'm a little jealous of singers. I'm, I'm a terrible singer, so uh, because that's like right there. I think singing is like. Boom, it's right there where we play an instrument, we write music, we have this other thing that interprets us. And I think the singing is much closer to who we are. So sometimes I think about that and think about we could find that, that same kind of quality in our playing, I don't know, maybe in our writing as well, but as like a singer, somebody who can just have instant access and be able to express it, um, it's powerful. Right. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Marcy. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh well, got, I'm sorry. Yeah. You got. Uh, Go ahead and unmute yourself, Marcy. Oh, there you are. I, I never heard of the concept that you're talking about of including all the different pieces of your life to express yourself. Yeah. It's very broadening for me to think about that as I go through my life, how I can express that. Yeah, and you can you can do whatever with that idea, whatever you want with it. For me, uh, just the simple idea that my parents were civil rights activists and that I was exposed to concepts that had to do with human rights and freedom um, made this project feel even more valuable or more worthwhile for me. Um, and uh, I even, so I, around this time, a little, a little while after that, I did, a, I did a gig at Dizzy's and I called it my mythology. And it was just basically pulling on songs that were from my background and stuff like my father and uncle, they were, they were studio musicians. Uh, they did all, they did film work mainly in TV, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s. My dad still was recording, I think, in the early 2000s. He's still alive. Um, uh, Mancini was one of the people, Johnny Mandel, David Shire, uh, John Williams. They worked with all these great composers. So I went back and I, I, I remembered my first discovery of music was a, was a Henry Mancini score. Uh, called Great Race, The Great Race. It wasn't the greatest movie in the world. It was a kind of a farce 
but uh, my dad had a lot of trombone solos and I was six when it came out. We went to the theater and we got the record. We came home and my brother and I played the record all the time. And they were on the Pink Panther. And I'd listen to that record all the time. And so when I played at Dizzy's, I called it my mythology. And I, I actually played music from my father and uncle's early recording stuff, uh, as well as the first things that I wrote, just to say, hey, you know, what, was the first, what was the first thing that I wrote? My, my first composition when I was 15 and made that something playable at, uh, at Dizzy's. So it, it's fun to kind of say, what is, what is my mythology? And how, how can I make sense of that and use it in some kind of way that brings something personal to, to uh, my music or my art? But uh, thanks for your question. I do see another um, question that's on here, which I can read from yeah. Dr. Yeah. Halberstam, right? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm a beginner jazz pianist. Can you recommend a good piano teacher in Brooklyn? My email mm -hmm. is, okay, great. So I see your email address and yes, um, I will definitely do that. I know some great piano pianists who, who live in, in Brooklyn and um, uh, can definitely recommend men's recommend somebody. I just have to make sure I know a lot of people live in Queens and Brooklyn, but I'm not sure which is where, so I'll have to double check that. But uh, that's great. Okay. So you'll follow up with the doctor. I will follow <laughs> up. Let me, uh, let me see if I can, I will take the time, but I'm going to copy that. Cool. Well, it. while you're doing that, um, yeah. we have a couple questions that came up, but before we get to that, there is a, there's a, a lovely little note in the chat from John. Um, he says, uh, your piece, Transformation, was an incredible personal and musical work. Very fascinating to hear how you were inspired by the political movements and inspirational speeches that embraced and uplifted different societies. Thank you. Thank you so much. I get a little full because um, that's the latest project that drew on things that I, keep, I kept expanding. And this was even a bigger topic or a bigger project um, for me, first of all, it was two sets of music, an entire evening at Jazz and Lincoln Center. It involved incredible um, guests like Glenn Close, but also Amy Irving and Wayne Brady. Um, my son, who's transgender, was born Emily, and uh, several years ago came out, wrote me a letter, explained everything to me, and uh, he came and read, read that letter, and you know, all this music was composed for all these different pieces. And each piece was about some type of transformation, personal transformation. So um, that will come out hopefully a little later in the year as, a, as an album. So um, uh, it means a lot to me. Um, I actually just set up a, uh, a Facebook page and uh, it's just getting started, but I've, I've posted a couple things on there, but it's called Transformation Stories. And it's just about, it'll include some of the things that we're on this project, but it's going to embrace other people's stories of transformation. And uh, so if, if anybody wants to, uh, to check it out, I think you could probably message the, uh, the Facebook page or do whatever. I'm not the greatest social media person, but I can't even believe I set this thing up myself, to be honest. But anyway, transformation stories, and you can check that out. I'm going to try to regularly post something about someone's personal transformation. And um, thanks. John, I think it was. Yeah. 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 I was in the uh, I was in the audience for one of those nights, and I don't think there was a dry eye in the room when your son read <laughs> that letter. <laughs> it was a. Uh, it was yeah. It was something else. Thank um, you, Lori. Yeah. No, it was important to me. And again, yeah. there there's a very strong personal, a strong personal um, involvement. I mean, how much more personal could it be than having your son read the coming out letter to me uh, about yeah. his being transgender, and I wrote some music I never would have written because of Definitely. that. And that wasn't necessarily my imagination, but it was, it was given to me and it was something I dealt with. Um, right. There was the, um, a, well, with Portrait in Seven Shades, I, 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 I went about so many different, I wanted to have a different, as, as different a, an approach to each piece as possible, just to give myself a real variety of textures and sounds. With Van Gogh, I wrote lyrics. It was the only time I ever I ever wrote lyrics, but basically just it was more biographical about his story and telling his story. And then creating um, a piece of music that was like an American standard. Um, um, okay. did, you, did you get a weird note? It just said yes, something about my Mac being used for something. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> no, it's nothing, always, weird, nothing yeah. weird about this. Uh, just it's about the sign-in thing. It's, I think it's just this computer, so I'm not worried about it. Um, but um, again, like for that piece, for Van Gogh, I said, uh, I want to take care of Van Gogh. He went through so much. He, he struggled. He only sold one painting in his life. He had some very challenging romantic relationships and, and never knew how appreciated he was. Um, and I wanted to write something that sort of like took care of him. So I wrote a very nice sort of easy standard that I felt was a sort of like, would, it wasn't challenging. It was something that would take care of him in some kind of way. And the lyrics just dealt with his biography. So that's a very different approach to something. Um, so it's always good to, to push yourself to try to find new areas of new things that you haven't tried before. And maybe, maybe it won't work. And I've written a lot of things that didn't work, especially earlier on. It was like when I was in Mel Lewis's band back in the, in the mid eighties, uh, I brought in my first big band arrangements and uh, one or two of them I brought in, they just, they sounded sad. Remember the first one I brought in, it was over in like in two seconds and Mel was like, that's it? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, it took me a month to write it. So I thought it was gonna last a little longer, <laughs> but, but you gotta put yourself out there and just try and keep working on it. And the more you do it, the more you, you get better at it or you get more connected to it. For me, um, just the more I do things, um, the more I can hone in or it's not like only just trying to get better and be more specific, but sometimes it's even finding a way to broaden and, and expand more that that's been happening to me more later later so i just encourage everybody to constantly try things constantly work on on your playing and your music and uh it'll all just keep developing you can't help but to do that that's the thing i keep telling people it's like people are worried about getting better how do i i'm so worried that i'm not going to improve and the thing is if you just play if you just practice and you write and you just do it the more time you spend on it the the more you will develop and you don't have a choice so that's a good thing um so i think we try can, to get to a couple more of these questions let's go to questions now i mean i've yeah i'm, I'm talking enough here I, I i'm sorry no no that's that's why we're all here um <laughs> let's uh i have a few questions in the chat but uh let's get to some of these uh guys with their hands raised um our first question comes from someone who you know and who you worked with just last week or i guess that was the week before um, Mr. Leo Steinreed. Leo. Hi. Good to see you again. Been um, seeing a lot of you lately. Yeah, I mean, I love, I always love hearing you speak, so it's always oh. inspiring. Um, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned about, um, like, laying down and, and kind of listening to the music and, like, to, to the room. Um, do you have any other kind of ritualistic things that you might do or kind of things that get your head in the right place to write um like not not just like the music itself but have it being in the right mental space yeah i mean it, i think it's really personal so um for me it's weird i there there was a time where i couldn't do anything unless like all the dishes were done and everything was put away and everything was clean and um and that's a little sort of anal you know it's sort of like everything's got to be perfect and the paper and the thing and everything, and then I can get to work and I and at a certain point you don't sometimes you can't have everything perfect around you so I started saying well I'm gonna have to just forget about that but I still sometimes feel like I need to have I can't be disorganized I can't feel like there are a lot of loose ends for me so uh, it doesn't mean I won't do the work because sometimes you just have to work you have to go to work you have to um, you have to get this piece of music done, regardless if you have a lot of loose ends in your life, whatever, it could be bigger things, it could be relationship things or bigger things or financial, or it could just be about, you know, did I put away my, my uh, laundry, you know, anything like that could be something that gets into your head a little bit. And so um, I try to just forget about, like, try to push away the things that take up space in my brain, that are not the creative thing, and fill that instead with the things that that go into my brain that help inspire me. So for me, there's could be a little bit of a ritual of just um, trying to be as organized as I can be under the circumstances and saying, all right, everything else can wait and let me, you know, get get to some music now. And I try to block out time. I don't I don't like trying to uh, fit in a little bit of time, but sometimes you can't help it. Uh, the times when I'm really busy and 
we have a rehearsal from, let's say, 10 to 6, 10 to 5 at, at Jazz Lincoln Center, and then we might have a concert, or we, I may have another gig, or uh, whatever. So I might have an hour, and then I grab a piano somewhere, and I work, and that's fine, and get a little bit of work done. But sometimes that hour is the be beginning part of it is still catching up to getting into that space, right, of like feeling creative and feeling. Um, and so if I can just block out a whole afternoon or five or six hours at home, then I can take that initial bit of time to get myself in the space that I need uh, to start working. Um, but, you know, you, you should be in the, you should make yourself be able to work anywhere. You could be in prison and you could be creative. You could be without anything but a piece of paper and a pencil on top of a roof and just be able to do whatever you need to do. Um, Vaclav Havel, who was a, a great writer and thinker and, and um, the president of uh, Czech Republic, uh, he was jailed and stripped of everything. And he said, and he wrote, he said, you, you could take everything, but you can't take my soul. You can't take my thoughts and my feelings. And that's really important that no matter what's happening, you still have all of this inside of you. You have your, your thoughts and feelings. And no one can mess with that. But I do know that there are composers like John Adams. I think we talked about him a little bit when we were, maybe, um, somebody that I was really inspired by and worked with a little bit, a uh, composer, um, more of a classical composer. Um, and he was known for being a nine to five writer. So he'd like just go to work nine o'clock and then five o'clock he was done and then he'd go about his evening. And I thought that was sort of interesting because you always hear about like inspiration, you gotta have it. And, but his thing was, no, you, you can be creative, you just do it. And that's pretty inspiring just to know that you can just decide to do it. But I wonder, I wonder still beyond that, like what for him, what that really means. Because I think everybody's got their stuff that they got to deal with. But um, yeah, I'm curious, so how do you deal with that? What do you, what do you come up with? What are you dealing with? Um, for, well, because for me, I, use, I, I tend to not try and force anything. I don't like to, I don't like to write unless I want to write. Sometimes I wake up and I really want to do it. And it's like, okay, we're going to get along today. And other days, it's really not happening. So I just, I don't, I don't force it. You know, you go practice scales or do something else. But I, um, I would like to be able to, to sit down and just kind of get something together. Like you were saying, like that kind of nine to five attitude. Um, and that, that's why I was, that's why I'm asking you about the, um, how to get into that mental, that mental space. Cause I think it's something you, I could, if I could be creative at a certain point, I could access that. So just trying, <clears throat> trying to figure out how am I going to, get to this you know whenever i want to yeah but i think you can i mean you're doing that now although we're in lockdown and so for, for a lot of us we don't have the same kind of schedule where we have to be somewhere i think as artists that's that that's happening a lot i think for business people they're still on the phone all day long doing their zoom meetings and everything hey we're doing a zoom meeting right now um all right here's i'm gonna i'm gonna look at the chat i'll, I'll see some of these okay. questions thank you leo by the way leo um he won um the essentially ellington Student comp composition contest this year, and uh, yeah. the congratulations to Leo. That uh, that whole lesson is actually up on our YouTube, our Jazz Academy YouTube page. So if you uh, if you miss it on the actual day, we we captured it and put it up on the YouTube page. And for any young composers, I think it's a uh, a good way to sort of peek into a, a private lesson with with Ted. So I encourage everyone to go check that out. Awesome. Uh, so I have a couple questions that people sent me. We have a couple people with their hands raised and I, I'm seeing you have a couple as well. So um, how would you like to proceed? Let me just, I'll look at the ones that are here. Yeah. Uh, from Marcy, I wanted to send this to everyone, but I was not given the option. Yeah, um, <laughs> Chloe made clear why uh, we have some weird people get on these things. Uh, Ted's uncle. So my uncle is referenced in Will Friedwald's book on Frank Sinatra, Ted has inherited a wonderful family tradition. Transformation stories is Ted's Facebook page. Oh yeah, this is just me helping out the people in the chat. Okay, I have good. I have a couple questions that I can we can. But I'll just I'll, I'll just make one comment about yeah. that. It's my uncle who passed away about ten years ago, my namesake uh, was a fantastic saxophone player, and he did, especially in the late fifties, he had been in in uh, L.A. for a little while and did most of Frank Sinatra's recordings. And Frank always wanted him on the dates because he liked his playing. He said in an interview, I don't, I didn't read uh, uh, Will's book, but um, 
he, uh, Frank, in an interview a long time ago, I think it was in the 80s in the biography or something, and uh, he said that Ted Nash was his favorite saxophone player. When I heard that, I was, I was so happy because uh, uh, he became my favorite saxophone player after I grew up a little bit and didn't just want to be hit over the head with Cannonball and, uh, and Charlie Parker. Um, but cool. uh, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. And, um, uh, and Judy, yeah, I have one from Judy. Okay, go ahead. Fascinating to hear a backstory on Seven Portraits. One of my favorite concerts of all times. Thank you, and I've been to thousands. Please have uh, Jalk make it a Wednesday morning release. It's so inspiring. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, I know they've been doing this this great thing, releasing a new um, concert, and I don't think this one was, I don't think this one was captured um, on a live stream. And uh, um, I have some, I have some stuff that I've kept from the concert, but nothing was ever done officially. And so there's no, there won't, that's not going to happen, unfortunately. But thank you so much, Judy. I really appreciate that. So, Thanks, okay, Judy. that's what I see. Okay, um, let's go to, well, let me get to one of these questions. Um, this is a great question from Ali. Um, he asks, can you talk about providing space for the soloists within your compositions, knowing that you're writing for the JLCO? Do you know beforehand who's going to do a solo, or is that a discussion that you have? Uh, it's important. You know, one of the things about jazz, and which makes it such a special art form, um, it's not a completely unique characteristic, but it's something that's it's one of the most important things about jazz music is, is the improvisation. I mean, we hear improvisation in a lot of other types of music, but for jazz, it really it became kind of more really the central focus, especially earlier on. I mean, the, the compositions that people made were more or less vehicles for, for improvisation. They were not necessarily compositions to be comp compositions, right? I mean, you go back to the heads that people would write on blues and I got rhythm and different standards, uh, Charlie Parker and then Sonny Rollins and, and people like that and Dizzy and then you started to have people like Wayne Shorter, um, who started to take, and Benny Golson, of course. I mean, his, they were still vehicles for improvisation, but the, the compositions became more deep and sort of more full of different implications. And, um, uh, and that continued, that trend continued until the composition became such an important way for artists to, to sort of inform their, their whole who they are in their music. And combined with their improvisation, that was more what was happening. And um, so considering the improvisation is really important. I mean, you can have pieces that, that don't have improvisation. It will still be jazz. But um, at a certain point, that's, that's kind of central to, to the music. And I know that when I studied with Bob Brookmeyer in the um, BMI Jazz Composers work, uh, Workshop back in, um, I think, 1990, maybe. He and Manny Album taught that. It still goes on now. There's still a workshop uh, that BMI hosts. And uh, But Bob Brickmeyer talked a lot about improvisation because it was, again, something that was important to the music. And his feeling was when you hand over, suddenly hand over the music to someone to solo, you're giving them license to change the experience of the composition, which can be good or bad. And so, um, you know, you have a big band chart or whatever, and suddenly now the tenor player has an open solo and the tenor player is just gonna play whatever, right? Maybe no regard for the composition or no regard for what the composer's objective of the piece is and all of this kind of stuff, um, which, was, which goes on now, it still happens all the time. So there's a question of how much responsibility do we give the, the, the soloist? And I think we have to think about that. I think especially more in modern music because we, we, want the, we want the piece to be a complete statement from beginning to end. And we don't want the solo just to be suddenly, okay, there's all this intense stuff over here and then a solo section, some more intense stuff like that. It should be one kind of continuous thing. Um, Brookmeyer was afraid to give people solos at a certain point. He started to make it less and less part of his music, which meant his music became almost more like classical music in a sense. And uh, so, and I worked with a trumpet player named Randy Sankey, who is versed in traditional, traditional music, 
as well as really modern music. And he wrote music, he had a whole um, a theory, a whole thing he developed uh, in how to improvise over his music. So it wasn't just like you just solo, he would stop you and say, no, no, you're not getting it. You have to move in this kind of fashion, you have to move from a, this type of interval to create the next thing. And then you, you look at the chord and say, and it was really complicated. And he would, we would rehearse not to get the parts down, but to get the improvisation, because that was the continuation of what he was, what he was hearing um, and, and composing. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, it can be very complicated. And now when I go to hear music often, at a club, let's say I go down to the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra or something, you hear a big band play, Thad, Bob Brookmeyer, some kind of piece of music, and then the solos will go on for a long time. And I love what a lot of these soloists are playing, but when you think about it in that context, you say, oh yeah, soloists are now just playing their thing and doing their language and it may be, may be connected. I mean, it's automatically connected, right? When it's in a form that has chords and a, and a certain amount of bars and all that. So it is connected. But there's a deeper way you can connect your solos to the material. And so um, in the last 15, 20 years or so, as I work with composers and musicians, we always ask, uh, you know, what, what are you hearing in the solo? Like, what is your vibe? Are you hearing it? And if a composer has a strong feeling about it, they will tell you, well, yeah, I want it to be kind of simple. Like, let's, let's keep it a little bit more simple, a little bit more rhythmic and maybe not you know, or I want this to be really be freer. I want you to not feel like tied to anything and just, so there's, so more and more, I think that instructions and direction we can give the soloist, the better. So in whatever our composing, whether it's a big band or a small band, it could be a chat at a rehearsal or it could be something you would write into a chart. I think with, with big band and bigger ensemble things, you, more that you can put in to the chart verbally is helpful but be prepared to talk about the solo sections because it's really, really important. I mean, we used to identify artists by their vibrato and their sound and their, the, the language that they created to solo. You think about Sonny Rollins versus Hank Marbley versus, um, you know, anybody. Wayne Shorter versus Jane Ira Bloom versus, uh, you know, the different soprano kind of things that are happening. You can really hear people's, people's personalities in the music. And as a composer, you don't want to lose your personality as a composer by just handing it over to somebody. Maybe, maybe you do, maybe it doesn't matter, but I'm, that's something to consider is, is what I'm saying. It's definitely, so it's a great, great question. Great, thanks for your question, Ali. All right, let's, uh, let's go to Mr. Les Rose for another question. Les Rose. Hey, Les. Ted, Chloe, oh, let me. There you are. We can hear you. What's up? Oh, good, good, good. Uh, Ted, it's wonderful to see you. First of all, I think of you often. I hope you're well. And my best regards to you and all of your loved ones. Um, first of all, you answered two of my questions. Yes, I'm practicing. And <laughs> <laughs> see the next trap. It's just for prop. Anyway. Um, and yes, I, I would have asked a lot about the soloing aspect, and that was a really, really great answer. Um, but I have another question. But before I ask that, you know, you never know how you're going to move somebody when with your art, with your art, and even with your um, lectures and presentation. You mentioned a movie before, The Great Race. And it might not have been the greatest movie in the world, but you just put me back into the Lowe's <laughs> Kings Theater in the balcony <laughs> with my parents in 1962 or whenever it came out. That's my exactly. friend, you have just landed right there with that. And not only was it that reason that it was one of the favorite movies because it was with my parents and the whole family going to a movie. But it was the first time I ever heard my name as a main character in a movie, The Great Leslie. <laughs> That's right, The Great Leslie. Oh my God. So you've and had an ego you know, ever since. I'm sitting in this movie and I hear my name and I'm 10 years old with my parents and I'm going, all right. I'm alive. Yeah. So That's thank it. you 
that. And now to know that your dad played on that, I've never missed it whenever it's on TMC or any, and I will never miss it. But thank you so much for that. Uh, the other thing, you know how much I love your uh, portrait in Seven Shades album, particularly your remarkable uh, transition to a small group with that presentation. And mm -hmm. believe it or not, I had it in mind on our last like real vacation when we went to uh, Barcelona and we were able to go to the Picasso Museum. And it was one of the museums, we've been to a lot of museums, it was one of the museums where we spent almost the whole day. And a lot of it was because we were watching how he started out as a mainstream regular artist. And then before you know it, the head is over here and the neck is over there. And be <laughs> before you know it, he's the Picasso that we love. And I had your piece in mind when I, when I was there at the Picasso Museum. So again, thank you for that as well. So a very, very quick question, of, and I'll let you expound on anything you want. But um, very quickly, where, if at all, does your technique come into play with all the inspiration and everything that you're doing to put together a piece? Are you looking back and going, uh, does that follow Fuchs's rules of counterpoint? Was that following the rules of harmony? Is that going to work? Where does technique, we know with actors, sometimes they give the greatest performance in the world and sometimes it's just their technique. Where does technique leave off and come in in your composing process? It's interesting because you talk about rules and uh, you know, the, like if you study four part, like Bach kind of harmony and stuff, you can't move in a parallel for, you can't move parallel line and you know, all this kind of stuff. And these rules were made, I, I don't think, you know, Bach sat down and wrote a whole book about rules and then started writing music. I think, and then when you hear about Thad Jones and his drop two voicings, or you hear about this or that, um, these people didn't necessarily say, these are the rules I'm following. They just started writing music intuitively. And then later people said, well, the reason why this sounds so good is because they are doing this. Um, so it, it all depends on when things happen, of course, because maybe back in, in the late 1700s, a, a major seven would sound like a wrong note um, or, you know, whatever. But um, I think that main, mainly it's intuition. It's your instinct to, to take everything you know and, and then know what to do with it. So you, you want to have the technique, you want to have all the tools. So that's why it's so important to practice or whatever, if you're gonna be an improviser, like I think about improvisation, having real equal parts of, of technique, that's the ability to play whatever it is you need to play. It's not just that you can play fast, it's that you can play what you are hearing or feeling. And there is um, idea and thought just, you have to bring your intellect to it in some kind of a way. And there's, there's theoretical knowledge and then there's expression and those four things you, you have to work on. And I think it's the same with anything. So with writing, how could you set out to write something that's deeply harmonic if you didn't have a, a good uh, a sense of, of harmony? I mean, you might luck into it or you might experiment. For me, a lot of it is not like, okay, did I follow a rule? Um, does this work? Because, I have the right format or a form or I'm adhering to something. For me, a lot of it is just, uh, it's just instinct. So uh, you develop tools. I mean, there's, there's a, so much I still need to learn in so many ways about rhythm, about harmony, about whatever. Um, but what I do have, I try to bring, and then, and then I try to use my instinct to say, okay, is that, is that, is that how I want it to be? And I change stuff a lot. So it's like, okay, that's not quite the direction I want to go, or that's not doing exactly what I wanted to do. Let me try this. So there's never a, a set way for me to do something. And I think most people feel the same way. But uh, I like that, and talk about imagination. And Leo also asked a question again about how you, 
he, he referred to that. And uh, for me, it's sort of like, where is it going? And that's the instinct of and using your imagination combined. It's like combining your imagination with all of your knowledge and your tools, then hopefully something comes, comes out of that. Um, it's the same with playing. You could have a ton of technique, but if you have nothing to say, if you have no, nothing to express, what's the point? And you hear people who play a zillion notes and, and you want to just leave because nothing is happening. I mean, I've, I've experienced that a lot. And then you could hear somebody just play a few things and just be like, oof, right there. Um, but you have to have the technique to be able to do whatever it is that you're feeling or you're thinking. Think about Miles Davis or someone like that. He had, he had a tremendous amount of technique. I mean, he cracked notes and people would make fun of him with his chops and all that, but he had incredible chops and he had incredible technique and he had incredible harmonic knowledge. He didn't try to hit you over the head with all that at all, all, all times. And that's important. He reserved to do things when he felt it was time to do them. And I think that that's the case with playing and writing. Um, I remember, remember there was a time where I had to write two charts for Jazz and Lincoln Center for our Christmas show, for our holiday show. And I did uh, We Three Kings and I did uh, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire, the Christmas song. And I spent, I, and Leo was asking about time and how you organize it. I spent two or three days of like hours a day uh, on this uh, Christmas song. And it just felt like over labored, overworked. I had a lot of dense harmony in this and it went through all sorts of keys and it wasn't like the worst arrangement in the world, but it wasn't, it wasn't really great. And I was like, oh, I forgot I have to do one more. I have, I have to turn that in like tonight or whatever. So the next one, I just said, all right, what about, okay, We Three Kings, the desert, all right, it's like weird. I'm gonna create some weird like um, overtones in the bass and maybe everyone's overblowing on the saxophones and, and I, I, I just make it really simple. And I wrote it in like three or four hours and turned that in. It was a, such a much better arrangement than the other one, just because I didn't overwork it. And I didn't try to put too much knowledge into it, too much technique into it. It was just very kind of simple. Um, I mean, whatever. That was just a really interesting experience for me. Um, so thank you, Les. Thanks for your question and your comments. Thank you, Les. Great. Be well. Yeah, man. All right. So it's 10 after um, five. I want to try to get to one more question, which I think is a good way to end. Um, okay. But I, and I think you may have just touched on it a bit in that answer. But um, we, I, I just, before we do that, I just want to take a second to just talk a little bit about what's coming up for us. So yeah. um, thanks guys for coming. I mean, as you know, we have master classes three days a week with the JLCO, as well as so many other events. Tonight is Skane's Domain, which is Wynton Marsalis's uh, live Zoom show that he does. This week is a special night because we have um, members of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra joining him. I think Ted's gonna pop by, right? Um, and we have other members that are gonna, um, like Carlos, I think, and Chris Crenshaw, they're all, they're all gonna be there tonight and they're gonna talk about, you know, a, a range of, of topics. That's always a fun, a fun time. That, that's 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Um, in terms of our master classes, the next one will be next, this upcoming Wednesday, and that's with Camille Thurman. She'll be celebrating some of jazz's double threats, iconic instrumentalists who were also vocalists. Um, that'll be here 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Zoom. Um, and then just continue to follow us on our social media accounts. Uh, just search Jazz at Lincoln Center on Facebook and jazz.org, spelled out D-O-T on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and, our, and our website always has all the information there for you guys, jazz.org. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is if it's within your means to please consider making a donation. You guys have heard me say this before. It's a tricky time for us here at Jazz at Lincoln Center as a nonprofit. It's a tricky time for artists in general. Um, and all of the financial support we've received over the past few months has been so, so deeply appreciated. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do that, um, please consider doing so. Um, with that being said, I'll just take this last question from Joshua. Um, he wants to know, he says, it's frustrating when I have a day job and limited time and focusing on music. It's hard to juggle sometimes between improving playing, writing music, any advice on how to fit in time to write music when 
time is so limited, especially when you're also working on other things like composing and practicing your instrument. Yeah, well, it's really hard. And I think that some people are really lucky. I feel really fortunate that I knew what I wanted to do at a young age and decided to do that, even though I struggled for a bit, you know, a few years financially trying to trying to make it and do all that. But I was completely 100% committed to that, didn't take another job. Very blessed that that went that way for me. Um, and I know a lot of people have made that, that decision, but sometimes that decision isn't easy to make. And we think more a little more practically about how we can pay our bills and maybe have another career or another interests as well. Maybe we have something we really want to do that isn't music and we try to do both. And um, very respectful, res respect, res respectable decision and situation to be in. Um, you have to, I mean, you know your time, you know what time you have. You basically have to find whatever time that, that you, ha you can carve out. The problem is, is that we often, when we think about practicing, when we think about what we, we want to do musically, it, it starts to become daunting. Well, God, I don't have the time I want to do it. What's the point? And you don't take the horn out or you don't do it. And uh, maybe I'll do it next week or tomorrow. I'm tired. I just got home from work. I'm tired. I know the feeling of that. I know I've come home from rehearsals all day thinking I was going to be creative in the evening. Nah, I'm going to just have a nice dinner. Maybe I'll watch a movie or, you know, whatever. But if, if you're not finding that time, you, you, have to, you have to make it happen. And there are people who just get a little less sleep because they stay up late and they work on it. They um, get up early and work on it. Only you know what kind of time you have and how to deal with that. But just know that if you don't put your time, time in on the horn or whatever it is you're doing, you won't, you won't make the kind of progress that you want to make. So you either have to find a way to compromise and work less on your other job and find more time or take the remaining time that you have in the day and just use as much of, of that as possible. Now, sometimes it's a luxury if you just, if you're a student, you're living at home, or all you have to do is practice and, and hang around and play. You can take your time and you have all day and maybe you have eight hours free and you spend four of it practicing. Well, you know, that's still four hours of practicing and you don't have that. So what happens is when people have that kind of luxury, they tend not to focus or be as efficient with their time. And, it's, and so they don't get as much done in a, in, a, in a certain amount of time, but you can focus your time better if you decide to do that, be very efficient with your time, make objectives, maybe on little breaks at regular work or whatever, write down some things that you want to accomplish in your practice routine, and then just get right to it and try to do things that are different and new that you didn't do yesterday, that you didn't do the last time you practiced. Um, so you're not just rehashing like, oh, well, let me just play, spend 20 minutes doing what I did yesterday. That may be important if you're, if you're struggling with something, you're trying to work through it, a hard passage or or a set of chord changes. But think about that. Think about how you need to find a way to get to a place that you're making improvement in a short amount of time. That's gonna be up to you. No one can answer that for you. And I can't tell you what to do in terms of your job um, or what kind of time you have or how to use it. Just know that if you don't find time, you're not gonna get better or you're not gonna improve as fast as you want to. So that's up to you and you're gonna to have to figure that out. It's important. It's important because it sounds like your soul needs to play and needs to be connected to the music. So just do do what you can, um, and good luck with that. It's awesome that you that you're doing that. So thanks, um, Joshua. All right, Ted, I'll just leave it with you to say goodbye, and then we'll uh, we'll be on our way as it's five. Okay. Now. Yeah, I see it's five fifteen. Well, yeah. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I enjoy your questions. I enjoy talking about music. I, I enjoy talking about music. So it's 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 fun for me to to be here with you all. And just to jump again on what Chloe said, sometimes people, I've talked to people about making donations to Jazz Linga Center and they're like, well, I can't, what I can contribute isn't going to help that much. And it doesn't have to be $10,000 or $500. It could be $5 or $10. And so, um, so don't, you know, if that's all you have, $5, it'd be, you don't understand how appreciated it is. Uh, like Winton talks about it, man. He says, I got a $20 donation the other day. Just, he said, I had tears in my eyes because I know that people don't have a lot of money, but whatever. And you don't, you know, if you can't do it, that's, that's totally understandable. I'm just saying that don't feel like it has to be some huge amount of money. Because if you can't afford that, they appreciate and Chloe was just talking about them, they appreciate such a small amount too. 
It's just knowing that you're supporting, they're working so hard on so many programs and they're dealing with this financial problem of the, the, the COVID stuff and they're just gonna push through. They're completely 100% committed to keeping this going. And um, it's remarkable the kind of work they're all doing, everybody's doing. And so um, just consider that. So, but thank you uh, everybody for being here and maybe I'll see some of you on, uh, on uh, Skane's domain tonight. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you so right, much, Ted. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, right. everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care.